My name's Kyle Simpson. I'm known as Getify online on Twitter and GitHub and all the other places online that matter. So you can find me there and provide me feedback. I, I thrive on feedback. I appreciate the feedback. I've given this talk a number of times, and it's radically different than it was the first time that I gave it um, just six months ago. And uh, that's because of feedback. So there's feedback that you can give through Twitter and all those other places, but also I thrive on the feedback. There's a feedback mechanism through O'Reilly. So please do give that feedback. If you'd like to take a look at today's slides, you just need to type in the part that's in blue. <clears throat> or you can type in the whole thing if you really like long URLs. OK, so um, just real briefly, uh, a self-serving announcement. I have a Kickstarter uh, that's got just about five or six days left on it for a book series that I'm going to write called You Don't Know JavaScript. I'm going to be attacking all the tough, mysterious, difficult parts of JavaScript um, as opposed to uh, some other books out there that really kind of stick to the easy stuff. So um, it's already been funded, but I'm trying to get to the stretch goal so I can write more titles in this series. I would hugely appreciate any support, either donating a dollar or whatever, or just helping spread the word about that. Now, I have these cards up here, and um, I list the URL to the Kickstarter, and also a super secret, completely unguessable code that if you mention that while you're donating on Kickstarter, you'll get an additional extra reward uh, just for being here at Fluent. Um, so if you're interested in that, please uh, take a look at that. OK, I'm also going to be doing an office hour immediately after this talk, right out there at one of those tables somewhere along there. So if you have thoughts and feedback after today's talk, if you want to tell me that I'm completely wrong or ask me questions or whatever, we'll have time overflow there. I will also be doing a book signing for my previous book, the HTML5 Cookbook. I'll be doing a book signing at that at tomorrow morning's morning break at 10.30 AM. That'll be in the expo hall. So you can come by and get a, uh, a free copy of the book if you're early in line. And I'll sign it if you are interested in that. OK, that's it for me. Now, I, I mentioned that I thrive on the feedback. So the very first time I gave this talk, I got one piece of feedback that all it said was that this was an angry white man rant. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I thought at first, wow, that person's really being brutal. But then I, I took that to heart and I listened to that. So I'm going to attempt, and I have been attempting as I've been refining this talk, I'm going to attempt to not be quite so much angry white man and, and a bit more uh, I'm trying to inspire. But we're going to be going through some difficult topics, and it's going to feel a little bit like a therapy session today. We're going to be talking about some of our uh, bad parts of our history of how we've dealt with this industry. So that might be where this seems a little bit angry, but it's more just about passion. Uh, this is, I think, the most important talk that I've been given a chance to, to give, and I trade in all my previous conference talks for the opportunity to give this one. Uh, so I'm, I'm very passionate about it. I'm also not an ivory tower sort of a guy. So this is not an ivory tower rant. I'm going to be saying some things that you're going to say, that's not practical, that's not realistic. And you might be tempted to think that I just sit up in some ivory tower and I don't know how the real world works. I've been in this industry for 12 years. I've had the exact same pain points that all of you have had with clients and bosses and all those things and hated all of those experiences. I'm trying to help us rethink so that we can move past some of those bad experiences. That's really all I'm doing. Now, I like to say about myself, but I think it's particularly true about this talk, that I don't think I have all the right answers, but at least I think I'm asking some of the right questions. And that's what this talk is about. If you've come here for the turnkey answer, the silver bullet to everything, this is the wrong talk, go next door. But this talk, I'm going to try to ask some questions and probe some things and force you to think about some things differently than may be comfortable or that you may have done in the past. So hopefully those questions will lead you to taking proper steps. And at the end of the talk, I'll give you some suggestions on what that first set of baby steps are to thinking about the web development industry in a new way. <clears throat> so as we go throughout today's slides, I just want you to pay attention to this guy, Joe. He will be coming on the screen, um, and you will see him throughout the presentation. So just pay attention to Joe. Um, we're going to deal with obsession. Like I said, this is going to be a therapy session. We're going to deal with obsession. And the obsession that we need to deal with um, is, or I mean, the, the thing that we're going to do with our obsession, you need to understand, the first step is admitting that you have a problem. What is that problem? What is our obsession? Our obsession is with browser versions. That's what we're talking about today, because I'm going to try to convince you that the concept of a browser version is completely outmoded. The fact that you have in your mindset or you have in your strategy at your company, we support IE 8 and above, and we do not support IE 7 and below, is a completely outdated concept. Now, Browser diversity is sort of one of those colloquial phrases we use because diversity can be both a positive and a negative thing. And this is not even close to the actual amount of browsers that are out there. I'm not even factoring in the mobile world. Now, I spent several hours building this next animation, so I expect some cheers and some applause with this awesome animation. But we can all sort of um, moan and groan that Opera's gone. But we still have 
lots and lots. I didn't get any applause for that. That's all right. That's okay. Thank you. That's a cheap speaker trick, right? So, uh, but even though Opera's gone, it's still using the same underlying WebKit rendering engine, of course, and we've got all the mobile devices and their variations of WebKit. So diversity is really sort of a tongue-in-cheek because there's so many things. In fact, you could think of the, the world of browsers as kind of, uh, we're, we're just so obsessed by having all these different browsers and all these different browsers that are trying out different things. Now, this is an interesting tweet. It says, the browser wars are over. WebKit won. This, this came out right after sort of, you know, the Opera uh, thing happened where Opera decided to switch to WebKit, and now it's called Blink or whatever. And then it says, Firefox is a fatally wounded animal shrieking loudly uh, as it, in denial as it slowly bleeds out. That couldn't be further from the truth. If you follow at all what's happening with Mozilla and Firefox, they've made their own mobile OS, and they're blowing away performance in terms of JavaScript. It's never been better, and they're writing a whole second generation set of um, browser engine called Servo and new JavaScript engine, all these things. So Firefox is definitely not going away, and their technology is not. But somehow we get this obsession that says WebKit is the thing. WebKit won on, wo on mobile, so therefore WebKit must have won the browser wars, and that's definitely not true. Now, this next one kind of speaks to our obsession a little bit, sort of in an irrational way. Uh, I will keep my latest version of Opera in a glass case in the middle of a room with that cool laser grid alarm shit surrounding it. Because this guy is so upset. I hope he's not in the room. I don't actually know this guy. But he's so obsessed with the... <laughs> He's so obsessed with his Opera browser. Now, what's interesting is he may be obsessed with the fact that Opera was more standards compliant than other browsers, but he's probably just obsessed with the idea that its developer tools worked a certain way or that it had uh, bookmarks or toolbars or other things. Um, you know, the browser world is, is really a lot more diverse than I think we want to admit. This next slide is just a tiny little slice of an image. You can find it out, of, out on Google that shows sort of a timeline of all the versions of browsers as they've gone throughout the years. And if, uh, basically what I want to say to you is if your strategy at your company or as a developer is that you map out all the versions and you keep up to date on all the versions, the versions that are coming out nightly and every couple of weeks these new versions of browsers are coming out, you can see browsers that you've probably never even heard of like Classilla, who's ever even heard of that, or Rockmelt or these other browsers. If you're actually trying to keep track of all these different browser versions and figure out what features work in different browsers and that's your support matrix, I call that crazy town. That just doesn't make sense because we arbitrarily decide, well, I only care about this small little section of it. I can take a small little section and I just sort of blissfully am unaware of what's happening with the rest of the world. I think it's better appropriate to call this diver diversity a raging hellish nightmare, but not because it has to be, just because that's the way we approach this industry. There's Joe. He's continuing to, uh, to come on screen. I'll just give you the punchline. I am giving you the world's slowest frame rate animated GIF or GIF or however the hell you pronounce it in the form of these background slides. So you can watch um, Joe as he comes on slides. Let's have a therapy session about the, the problems, the way that we've been appro approaching this incorrectly. The first thing I want to deal with, lies, damn lies, and statistics. That's a great quote from Mark Twain. You might... might uh, recognize that. But we're going to deal with some lies that I think have been uh, sort of hoisted upon our industry, and we've accepted those things as fact, as reality, and I don't think they are. So the first one of those lies is that the browser version still matters. Now, I put still there in parentheses because I think it's probably true that back in the early days when there was only one or two browsers, and there really wasn't browser competition, it probably really did matter. There was a vast difference between what was happening on Internet Explorer and early versions of Netscape. It probably really did matter that you knew what the browser was. Today, it doesn't matter. Today, we have embraced the concept of constantly updating browsers, web standards, all those things. So the browser version doesn't matter. Now, you're going to say, well, yes, it does, because that's how I figure out the features. And I'm going to say, browser versions are just an arbitrary marketing label. I worked at Mozilla for a while, and, and I saw sort of firsthand when they, I started right as they switched to the time-based approach, and what they call the version, when they say Firefox 22, that just means that's the date timestamp when that arbitrary set of features happen to make it. And there's a whole set of politics and other things that happen to, to whether or not something gets on the train or not. But it, it wasn't that somebody sat down and said, well, this is exactly the, a coherent set of features that we want to put. Features sometimes make it in, sometimes they get flagged off and preferences or things like that. The features that are present in your browser are what matters, but we sort of put this arbitrary label on top of it so you can write good blog posts about it. I would argue that's a marketing decision. It's not a technical decision. Further proof came out just recently when we started to see some leaked versions of Internet Explorer 11 coming out, and everybody freaked out 
because Internet, Internet Explorer 11 apparently, although we don't know for sure, but apparently it's going to pretend that it's an entirely different browser. And some people were up in arms about this, like, what are we going to do? And I just sat back and I said, this is further nail in the coffin. It's further proof that the concept of us trying to determine what the browser is and make some sort of guess about it is ridiculous. This goes back to IE6 days. You used to say, well, if it's IE6, I can count on these things, except there were all these administrator settings and antivirus programs and proxies that could interfere and prevent those features from working the way they ought to work, stripping out headers and doing all sorts of things. So us making this arbitrary determination about a browser's features based upon this arbitrary marketing label is ridiculous. The truth is that it's the features that matter. And every other software dis discipline besides ours, long ago, decades ago, embraced the idea of feature detection. And yet, that's sort of a relatively new thing for us. Now, I'm not saying that we don't know what feature detection is. Some of you in this room use Modernize and other libraries like that to great effect. But I would say, by and large, we're very new to this concept of depending upon the features. And I would say you should be feature detecting everything that you consider to be mission critical. You should not be making assumptions about what's there simply because you tested it in one version or one particular scenario of IE7. I love this tweet that kind of sums up really the mindset, the crazy mindset behind browser detection. It's like asking what house you're in to find out where the bathroom is. Why not just check the rooms to see if you find a bathroom? If we make this assumption that there's a house and I know this house labeled, so therefore I know the bathroom, that's crazy. So features are important. And a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of different websites out there that talk about the features. And they talk about features in terms of which browsers support which features. So it's OK for you to use a site like caniuse.com, or this one is called iwanttouse.com. And you can try, tr type in a feature and figure out whether or not the browsers, w which browsers are going to support those things. But here's where it has to stop. You have to ask, this, you have to ask the question, which features, if I choose to use this feature, which browsers will that work in? Which browsers will it not work in? That's an OK question for you to ask. But when you start doing the inverse, when you start saying, I know that all IE7s will have this feature, you've made that jump. You've made that assumption that's not necessarily true. You still should be feature testing for the things that you care about. Now, who are the people that primarily tell us this set of lies, this particular lie that browser versions matter? Well, I'd say the primary culprit is analytics. We go into our Google Analytics or whatever analytics package that you use, and we read through the statistics, and it says, well, 5% of our users are still using IE6. Well, I want to ask you, how reliable do you think that actually is? Because it's subject to all the same problems that's going to cause all kinds of user agent string um, checking to fail when IE11 comes out. It's relying entirely upon the browser pretending to be some particular arbitrary marketing label. There are a whole bunch of places that, that happen in the web infrastructure, like proxies. You know, AOL was famous for a while. They were kind of changing headers that were you know, going out um, with web requests to try to pretend to be different browsers and things like that. There's all kinds of things in the web infrastructure between the browser and the server that can change what a browser is pretending to be. So analytics tells us we've got IE6. Therefore, you know, it's 5% of our users. Therefore, we have to support that 5%. But I would say to you, I think that's really just sort of an assumption that those are really true. And, and here's my proof. Uh, I still look at my statistics. I still get told that people come to my site in Netscape 4.7. I highly doubt there are actually people still typing on Netscape 4.7. And they're certainly not coming to my technical blog. Why would they be, you know, why on earth would they be doing that? But I still get that showing up in my analytics. There has to be some degree of variance here. So we, we don't really have a good grasp on how much we can um, believe those numbers, and yet we take them to be truth. We say it's 5%, so therefore we, we pick a magical number like 5%, and we say, okay, well, I've, I've got to still support until we get under 5%. You know, bloggers are also doing this. Bloggers go out there and tell us all these things. They write all these things up. They, they analyze statistics. They do analyzations across the top 200,000 websites on the web. And they tell us the same things. And it even filters into our marketing departments. What's sort of interesting is that our marketing departments are doing now with cross-browser support what 10 years ago we, we considered to be ridiculous with processor speeds. We advertised the, the heck out in marketing out of a processor speed being double the previous processor that came out, and nobody paid attention to the underlying detail that the bus was the same speed, so it really wasn't going to speed up, or, or things like this. A marketing department attaches to this concept of browser support, but they have no idea what the technical underpinning for that is. So they begin to tell us, and they sell to your customers, they market to your customers as a differentiator. We still support IE6. We're better than our competitors, or some ridiculous thing like that. 
He's continuing his jump. The next slide that I want to look at, and this is the big one, it has to feel, look, and behave exactly the same in all browsers and versions. Many of you have believed this to your core, that the web platform was built so that we could create exact sameness in every single browser. If you were to pull out an old iPhone, you know, original version, iPhone 3, and compare it to an iPhone 5, and then say, well, this iPhone 3, we've got to figure out some way to hack it so it's exactly the same you know, capabilities as an iPhone 5, people would laugh at you. But we say the same thing about trying to make Chrome 28 and IE6 look and feel and behave exactly the same. It's ludicrous. The truth is that browsers are different on purpose. They are intentionally different. They intentionally fork features and try things different ways. Look at all the new HTML5 form elements. If you looked at it when it was in Opera and then you looked at it in Firefox and you get vastly different user experiences around these things, that's on purpose. And I've seen designers that get so upset about the fact that they can't control the way a form element natively looks in one or the other browser. That's just, it's crazy. It's an obsession with things that we shouldn't be obsessed about. It's a misfocus of our effort. Really what this entire talk about is about identifying where we've been misappropriating our focus so that I can unlock some amazing potential. The talent in this room is incredible. The talent that could change the web, could push us forward, is locked up focusing on crap like IE6. Who's the ones that tell us this lie? Well, you're definitely, your bosses are telling you this lie. Your bosses are telling you that because that's where they grew up. They, they grew up in that mindset, and their boss tells them that, and their boss tells them that. They say, well, it's, it doesn't matter whether it's irrational. We still have to support all the browsers exactly the same. Your clients are also telling you this. If you're an independent developer, your clients are doing this irrational thing, like opening up a page in Firefox and Chrome and IE, looking at it side by side, measuring the pixels, and doing this ridiculous stuff that nobody in the real world does. Your clients are insisting on things that are going against the grain of the way the web platform is designed to work. We're supposed to be able to embrace the fact that the web platform is ever-changing. It's experimentation. It's trying new things. It's giving users the choice to say, this is something I like the form elements in Opera better than I like them in Chrome or whatever. And we're completely trying to eliminate all of that differentiation. We've somehow set ourselves up as the ones that have the right to foist that upon the rest of the community that uses the web. And I think it's probably because we try to build the web for other people that think like us. We build the web for other developers. Now, you may have a developer-focused website, and that's okay, but most of you are probably in the business of building the web for my grandma and my kids. But you're not thinking like that. You're thinking like it's got to work and feel like another developer would respect this website. Your sales department's also attached to this lie. They use the fact that you support IE6 as a way to close a deal because another client that you're trying to sell a job on has the same irrational lie burned into their brain that it has to work on IE6 and it, and it can't possibly look or feel differently in that. So your sales departments use that and they sell a job, they sell a task based upon that promise that's irrational and against the way the web platform works and long after when it lands on your desk, you're stuck picking up the pieces. So these are some of the symptoms of where these lies are coming from. And it's twisting and diverting and, and, and morphing our industry into something that it's not supposed to. Let me give you an example. Imagine we've got an e-commerce site, and that e-commerce site uses you know, these buy me or buy it now buttons. Now imagine that a user comes to that website in Chrome 28, and they get the top button with the nice uh, rounded corners and the proper spacing and everything. And then another user comes to it in IE6, and they get um, the bottom you know, example here, and then they come to it in Opera or something, and they get some other weird spacing. Now, there's a mindset that prevails, this, this underlying mindset that it has to look and feel and behave the same, is that you have to go in and figure out how to hack your CSS to make IE6 and Opera or whatever look exactly like Chrome did. And I think there's an assumption there that's not backed up by any research, by any, it doesn't even make sense, but there's an assumption there that if a user shows up at a site and they're ready to buy your $1,000 TV and they see this button, they're going to be confused, they're not going to know what the hell to do, and they're not going to click the buy button. But the truth is that user is already on, if they're in IE6, they're already having a really terrible experience with the web. They're seeing this sort of thing all over the place. They're not going to show up at bestbuy.com or whatever your e-commerce site is and suddenly say, oh my God, this site looks terrible. I can't possibly uh, come to, to spend my money here, so I'm going to go to a competitor. That's just not the way the world works. There's no research that says if you have some extra padding or the text is wrapped weird or something, that it's going to affect their buying decisions. 
there's far more evidence to support the fact that their buying decisions are based on do you have the right product and is it at the best price? I know that's a shocking thing to think about, but it's not based upon whether you could figure out some clever hack to make that CSS work. Another example, with our clients especially, your clients open up a site in Firefox and Chrome, and they're concerned about the fact that text doesn't render exactly the same in the two browsers, and they open up Photoshop, and they go in and they count pixels and do measurements, and they tell you, I need you to go in and figure out how to make this text you know, one pixel to the left because it's not rendering the same as Chrome. That's about as much sanity as if somebody goes to a custom furniture store and buys two custom tables and then goes home and uses a laser measure and gets mad when they're one millimeter apart. That's not the way this works, and yet we're so concerned about this, and, and, and the people that force us to do these things are so concerned about a couple of pixels here and here, and it's not affecting the user experience of the web. I'm sorry if you're, if you're one of those designers and you're just you know, so mad at me right now because you're like, no, it, it really is. It's so important. The, the way I design it is so important. You're not using a pixel-perfect medium. I'm here to tell you that. You're not using a pixel-perfect medium. If you want that, go back to print. The web is a constantly evolving and a constantly dynamic medium, and you need to embrace the idea that things can be different. We're continuing to watch Joe. Joe is a metaphor, by the way, if you hadn't caught that. We're continuing to watch Joe. Um, things are not looking so good for Joe in the same way that things have not been looking good for our industry for a while. So we like to hold on to these lies very strongly, and we have a whole set of excuses that we've built up for why we can't get rid of these lies. What are those excuses? Well, the first big one that everybody's heard of and everybody has probably uttered several times in their career, say it with me, IE sucks. IE6 sucks, right? That's the big excuse. That's the reason why our industry is being held, held back. That's the big reason why we have to obsess over all these details is because IE6 just sucks. So we get into this pattern of blaming the browser. We blame the browser for all of our problems, and we don't take any personal responsibility for the fact that we might be able to learn our craft a little bit better. Douglas Crockford's famous for going around and putting up this giant slide that says IE6 must die. And then he put up a slide that says IE7 must die. And then he put up a slide that said IE8 and IE9. He, he just is constantly focused on the past. Microsoft got in on the game. They've put up countdown websites for their old versions of their browsers. So they've been obsessed about IE6 and then now IE7 and IE8 and trying to get rid of these old browsers. They know that it's a, a pain point for the people that use their systems and they know that the prevailing thought is to blame Microsoft for this problem that we're in. In fact, there's been articles that have been written where people have said, in point in fact, it is, it is the old versions of Internet Explorer that are directly responsible for holding the web back. In fact, they go so far as to name IE9 as holding us back. Is that really true? I mean, IE9 was light years ahead of IE8, and yet we're still, and, and when we're concerned at this point that IE9 is our big problem, that's holding us back? That's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, it's missing a few things like CSS transitions that are pretty cool, but it's a dramatically more capable and powerful browser than IE8, and yet we're still lumping it all together and still saying, well, it was made by Microsoft, so it must, by de facto, you know, sort of be bad. <clears throat> There's this statement that he also makes in that same talk that says, the past is the enemy of the future. And I would, I would challenge that. I would say, I think the enemy of the future is obsessing about the past. If you're constantly obsessed and focused on the past, I think you never will take steps forward to the future. It doesn't go just for Internet Explorer, by the way. There's this new trend for, like, best viewed in WebKit or best viewed in Chrome or whatever, the same crap that we had, you know, 10 years ago. We're revisiting and doing it all over again. This is a website that came out and said, and by the way, if you'll notice in the screenshot, this is a new, uh, newly kept up-to-date version of Firefox that pulled up this website and said, you're using an outdated browser. Really? I thought my Firefox was quite up-to-date. You're using an outdated browser which adversely affects your file transfer performance. That's sort of strange to me as a developer because I think it's more like my network speed or my wireless you know, card or something like that. I think those are the things, network congestion, those are the things that affect file transfer performance, not whether or not I'm using Firefox or, in this case, Chrome. It says, while other browser vendors are still struggling to in implement the full spectrum of HTML5's functionality, Google Chrome has it all today. To enjoy Mega's full power, such as blah, 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 we strongly suggest abandoning your current outdated browser and updating to Chrome as soon as possible. This is the message that we present to users. Now, my grandma doesn't use this website, but let's pretend for a moment that my grandma uses this website. 
And I went home, just like all of us do at Christmas break, and we switched her IE icon to loading up Firefox, and I did the right thing and set up the automatic updating in Firefox so that it's constantly up to date with the nightly versions or whatever. And then my grandma goes to a website, and she gets presented with this, and she says, she calls me up, and she says, well, I thought I had an updated browser, but apparently I don't have an updated browser, according to this website. I mean, this is not helping users. Most users don't even know what a browser is. The statistics say that a majority of users don't even understand the concept of a browser. And yet we're, we're obsessed about minor differences between Firefox Nightly and Chrome Nightly. That's ridiculous. And as the metaphor goes, things continue to get worse. What's well, another excuse? Well, when we stop blaming the browser, now we blame the user of that browser. Now, this particular one came out, and it turned out later that it was kind of a joke, but the Internet Explorer 7 tax. It appears you or your system administrator has been in a coma for over five years, and you're still using IE7. Now just stop to take that in for a moment, the brashness of that statement, to assume that there must be some reason that you must have been in a coma. That could be the only reason why you'd still be in IE7. To help make the Internet a better place, you'll be charged a 6.8% tax on your purchase from this website. And here's the great part. Here's the great part of this, because it goes to an even deeper level. This is necessary due to the amount of time our web team has to waste to ensure our site appears correctly in IE7. As if uh, you're incapable of making it work without wasting lots of time, and as if users are going to prevent, you know, they're not going to buy because your website looks a little different in IE7. It's just ridiculous to assume those things. And it's insulting to users. The, the vast majority of this messaging directly insults the user. Another example, this one from, you know, obviously some years back, but this was a modal that would pop up and it, you could not make it go away. It would pop up and it would show you the website behind it, sort of teasing you, and, and it would say, you know, you need to upgrade. And here it's obviously dated because it says IE7. But here's, what it was, here's how it was explained why this was a good idea. It said, the idea is to force users to upgrade from IE6 and avoid the website from a bad reputation that the website is not rendering correctly in IE6. So that's the big problem. These users are brain dead, they're in a coma, and they're giving us a bad reputation because we can't do our craft correctly and make the site work. That's the mindset that we've used to justify this sort of behavior for well over a decade. And I'm here to tell you I think it's ridiculous and it needs to stop. This is not pushing the web forward. This is part of what's holding the web back. Now, God bless them, this was a great you know, idea, the spirit behind this campaign. Many of you may have participated in this where you would put a script into your page and it would automatically redirect users of quote-unquote old or outdated browsers to a whole new page. Now, I want to ask you a question because I've asked this of my mom. I've asked my mom, and I'm asking you the same question. If you intended to go to xyz.com and you show up at xyz.com and immediately you get redirected to some other website that you don't know about, what's your first assumption? Probably that there's a virus redirecting you, because that's what most users on the web see. And yet we thought that it was a good idea to redirect people to this strange website that you know, is upgrading them about stuff that they don't even understand. This is for developers. This is building the web for developers and not building it for my grandma and my kids. We just keep going deeper and deeper in this hole. It just takes so much time and effort to make IE6 work. It's just so hard. I like this tweet. One browser engineer's bug is a web developer's hack. Browserhacks.com came out recently, and they, it allows you to search for these different sorts of hacks. And so, you know, we think that part of our craft is figuring out ever more crazy hacks to get around these problems. And so we do, you know, silly, insane things like looking at these different characters that, you know, placed in certain positions can allow us to target CSS to a particular version of IE. And it's just ridiculous. And at one point, Although it may not be true now, but at one point, this was revered as state-of-the-art in the web development industry. And I like to imagine that other people in other software development disciplines just looked at us and laughed. That's the height of you know, what you could come up with. That's what you spent all of your talent doing, was figuring out hacks like that. You know, conditional style sheets were hailed as sort of the answer to things. And, and I think it was a little bit better, but only marginally better, because now we've shifted the problem from having to make one style sheet that's lots of hacks to now, you know, it's, it's usually enough work for a development team to maintain one style sheet well, and now we have to maintain like four or five or ten different style sheets, and they're never actually correct. So I actually don't think that this was pushing us forward that much. I think this is still just a hack. It doesn't go just for CSS. It also goes for JavaScript, and here I'm picking on myself because I stole this code 
from a library that I wrote and released in the open source world. Because several years back, I couldn't figure out any other way than to do browser sniffing. So I used what I called, I, you know, I said this was better because I did what I called browser sniffing or browser inferences uh, rather than, you know, looking at the user agent string. But it's still the same thing. I'm sort of making these assumptions. And I made a giant assumption that there would always be a window.opera. And boy, how stupid I look because there's not going to be any window.opera anymore. This is a, a set of code that was used. It was actually in libraries like jQuery for a while, but it was used to detect the DOM ready event because we didn't have the DOM ready event. And there was this obsession with, oh, I've come up with an even crazier hack to figure out DOM ready in Internet Explorer. And, and I, I just sat back and I thought, why can't we just fall back to window.onload? We know that event has worked from the beginning of time in all browsers. Yeah, yes, it would be a degraded experience for those users. Yes, they would have code and actions that would happen at a later time. But why is that such a bad thing? Why is it better for us to figure out stupid, crazy hacks like whether or not the scroll event can fire on a particular div, and that's how we infer that DOM ready has passed? It's just ridiculous. So you say, well, those are all hacks, and, and, and good developers don't use hacks anymore. So let's talk about the cool features. What about all the cool features? Because we still hack those things, too. What about rounded corners? This comes from a blog post that talked, I think it was from Google, and they were talking about uh, they were heralding the idea that their engineers had come up with this clever way to take a little one-pixel notch out of the top corner, and they were using all this extra divs and CSS, but they'd come up with a cross-browser way to take that little notch out and make the ever-so-slight you know, uh, implication that there's rounded corners. And I bet most of you, especially from where you're sitting, can't even tell that this box or that this box has a slightly rounded corner. True story about this, I was, I was working at a job one time, and the designer said we need to make these modal boxes with rounded corners. And our job was to support Internet Explorer 6 and above and Chrome, any version of Chrome. We didn't care about Firefox for some reason, but IE and Chrome. Of course, Chrome had the CSS rounded corner, so we did our due diligence and went to our boss and said, hey, we want to use um, this, this new set of uh, CSS features to do the rounded corners, and of course it'll just sort of gracefully fall back on, on the IE browsers and it won't show the corners, and the boss was like, eh. That's not going to work because he was believing that same lie that it had to look and feel the same. And so he said, well, the other option, which is crazy hacky, is for us to go in and use images as a fallback or use images as our rounded corners, as many of you have probably done with the little tables or the sliding door effect or other things like that. So that's our other option. He said, eh, that's not good either, which made me happy. Until he said the next thing, which was, well, we're just not going to do rounded corners at all. Because there's this mindset that says, for him, we're just going to water it down to the worst possible browser, the worst possible experience. We're going to prevent all those users that are using a better and more modern browser from being able to experience something uh, like rounded corners. It's ridiculous. Why are we so upset about the fact that some boxes might be square for some users and rounded for others? It's ridiculous. Gradients are the same way. We went to enormous amounts of hacks. I put together a solution one time that had 17 nested divs so that it could do this sort of you know, rounded gradient crap. And that actually went out into production, and it's still on that huge website even today. It makes me sick. But now, by the way, now that we've got gradients in the web platform, now gradients are not cool anymore. We've gone back to flat design, so uh, don't use gradients anymore. <laughs> what about drop-down menus? There was so much of an obsession about drop-down menus. How many of you have done that crazy hack where you had to create like a transparent iframe behind a menu so that it could overlay over a flash element or a select box in IE6 or whatever? Yeah, many of you are, and if you're not raising your hand, you're lying, because I know all of us have done that. Why didn't we just do like three lines of code that said, if it doesn't properly respect the z-index, which is, by the way, a detectable thing, if it doesn't properly respect the z-index, why don't we just show the menus completely expanded? Or why don't we just not have a menu at all? When you click on it, it takes you to a page that shows you the menu options. That would have taken almost no lines of code, and yet we went to all this trouble because the designers told us, no, the, the menu's got to be there in all browsers. File uploading is the same way. For a decade, we had the normal file upload button that worked just fine, and then we got all enamored with flash uploaders and progress bars, and then we added that into the web platform. And so now we're so enamored with the idea of having you know, multiple files in parallel with progress bars and all this stuff that we can't stand the idea that an old user in an old browser might have to use the old busted file upload button. So we've got all this trouble to put in flash file uploaders as fallbacks and crap like that. Why don't we just fall back to that button? It worked well for well over a decade. Are those users going to say, well, I'm just simply not going to use your website because I can't get progress indicators? No. Video is my favorite one. We're so obsessed by, uh, by having video experiences that 
Even today, sites even like YouTube, they still use the Flash-based player as their primary player. And I, I would say we should be using HTML5 video and only HTML5 video. And if a user doesn't have an HTML5 capable browser, you just give them a link to the video and they download it and play it themselves locally. We shouldn't be doing this kind of crap with Flash um, video players and things like that. So what this all boils down to, that I say you should just learn your craft. There are ways to focus your energy and time that aren't based upon all these hacks and regressions and polyfills and all this stuff. You can build simple, graceful degradation and fallbacks to previous core web technology like the file upload button or like the link to download a file. You can build those things without too much work. But it takes, a, it, it takes uh, removing yourself from the obsession that it has to look and feel and behave the same. And then I would say you need to get over the fact that it's going to be different. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to get all up in arms about, oh, I've got a user that's complaining because the file upload works differently. And you're going to say, sorry, that's just part of how the web platform is. And you start educating them and, and retraining them. <laughs> Things have really gotten bad for Joe, haven't they? Finally, the excuse that web technology just flat out isn't ready. You may have heard about a member, a prominent member of the W3C came out uh, you know, a year or two back and they said, it's going to be at least 10 years until HTML5 is ready. Oh, really? Because I seem to be using it all day, every day in my job and everything's going great. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which version of HTML5 he thinks is going to take 10 years. And then famously, Mark Zuckerberg came out and said, this multi-hundred billion dollar company that I've built, the giant biggest mistake that I ever made was using HTML5 for my mobile app. I mean, it's just kind of ludicrous to think that that was his biggest mistake. Of course, he came back and clarified later that he, you know, whatever. But nobody cared about what he clarified. They only cared about this headline, Mark Zuckerberg says that HTML5 sucks. And I cheered so loudly, you probably could hear me through my computer over the Internet, when Sencha, a few weeks later, came out with a completely rebuilt Facebook application that they called Fastbook, completely built in JavaScript and HTML5, and it beat out the performance not only of Facebook's um, hybrid web app, but also of their native iOS app. They proved that it's not, the, it's not the tool that's wrong, it's the tooler. They couldn't figure out how to use the technology correctly. And so we see Joe is having a face plant. <laughs> Be catching the metaphor. So are we finally out of excuses? What can we do? Are we finally out of excuses? I say let's fix it. This is a very telling tweet because you can read this one of several different ways. A user rep reports that our new response of HTML5-based flash-free website does not work in Internet Explorer 7. Nobody cares. Now, I would argue with you that this tweet, clearly, especially from the responses to it, this tweet um, was being very sarcastic. And people thought it was really funny. Nobody cares about IE7 anymore. I would argue that it comes to the correct conclusion for the wrong reason. The, right, the wrong reason here being sort of sarcasm, and I don't really care. And the right conclusion is that we really shouldn't be so upset about the concept of supports. We really need to redefine what we mean by supports. Because it doesn't have to be exactly the same in IE7 to still be functionally correct. We need to embrace things like browser differences. Browsers are different on purpose, on purpose, and that can be an upsell that users have the option of choosing this form element or this set of things or this set of features if that's the thing that they care about. We need to build apps that are flexible to that sort of user choice rather than sort of inflexibly forcing people into one particular path because we've decided that that's the best path. Embrace feature detection. I've already talked about that at length. Libraries like Modernizer, there's all kinds of other feature detects out there. And I would basically say on this topic, if you consider something to be mission critical, you either must feature detect for it, or you must not use it, or you have to at least monitor the user experience to find out if the user is not satisfied with what's happening so that you can put in some sort of fallback. You have to do one of those three things. You can't f fall back, quote unquote, to this user agent detection crap. We need to redefine the concept of supports. It needs to be sort of a gradient, it need, you know, quote unquote, or, or you know, pun intended. It needs to be this spectrum from it works completely to it works functionally, but it looks like crap. And, and even we've got features turned off that just simply can't work in, on old Internet Explorer 6, but the majority of our application or the main point of our application still works. And we don't send out style sheets, so we let it just be black and white text, but it still allows a user like my grandma to decide, I'm going to use my old computer in IE6, and I'm going to pull up your page, and I can still get the content. I don't need all the fancy stuff. 
What happened to user choice? What happened to allowing the user to decide how they experience the web? When did we get put in the driver's seat to say that we as developers are the gods of the internet and we get to decide how people experience things? What about oh well degradation? Basically, as I said before, just kind of, uh, oh well, you know, they don't get that feature. That's not that big of a deal. That's not that terrible if they don't have file uploading. Say you have a profile, you know, a social networking site and you've got file uploading and you can't stand to use, you know, the normal file upload button. So for old users, they just can't upload photos. That's just one tiny part of a gigantic, you know, social network that you've built of stuff that they can use and just turn off that feature for them. Putting in regressive file, you know, fallbacks like those file upload buttons. Progressive enhancement, of course, that's an upsell to be able to say, hey, my new website, it, it automatically has new features as soon as a browser starts supporting those things because I built, you know, future forward thinking. And finally, I'd call this reactive design. I know there's a lot of buzzword around the, the concept of, um, of uh, you know, responsive design, which is just re being responsive to your screen size and orientation. I'd call this reactive design. Our applications need to react to the environments that they run in. You need to be constantly monitoring that environment. Because when you first load a page, things might be great, but now the user may have 2% battery life, and, they've, you know, and the, the device is uh, cycling down the CPUs, and it's not giving very much power. And you're not monitoring that, so you're not reacting to that environment and shifting things back to the server or turning off extraneous features or things. There's so much of that that is completely unexplored because we spend all our time worrying about those IE6 hacks. And that is, that is the essence of what I'm trying to unlock. So, in my last couple, I know I'm, I'm slightly over, but in my last minute or two here, I just want to vision cast for you how your first few baby steps are going to go with this. On Monday morning, you're going to go back to your job, and maybe you've believed that this is now the right sort of discussion to have with your team or with your boss, and things are going to be difficult. You're going to have to fight lots and lots of small skirmishes, and you're going to lose most of them. You're going to have this argument that says, hey, let's build it this way because this makes a whole lot more sense and it embraces the way the platform works, and your boss will say, well, that sounds great, but I still need you to get it out today. And you're going to lose that battle. But I promise you, if you never have this conversation, if you never ask that question, it's never going to get better. And you're constantly going to be developing 10 years in the rearview mirror. And that's not what I want for our industry. It's not what I want for me, but it's not what I want for our industry. I want to unlock the, the true potential. So you're going to have to start by retraining some people. You're going to have to retrain your bosses about how the web platform really works and how it always should have worked. You're going to have to retrain them, and you're going to have to have conversations like the total cost of ownership of properly designed software is lower than the total cost of ownership of hacky software that has to be rehacked over and over again. You're going to have to retrain your clients and tell them they're not always right just because they say, I write the check, so therefore I get to say that it has to be the same. That doesn't make them right. You're going to have to have conversations like, my bill will be cheaper if you let me build it according to web standards rather than spending all my time hacking for old browsers. And finally, you're going to have to retrain the marketing and the sales departments. Tell them to stop con you know, considering the idea that they distinguish themselves in their industry by saying we support IE6. Instead, give them the idea that they can upsell the idea that an application can be written correctly and it can amazingly, automatically get new features as soon as a browser releases a new version, automatically a whole new set of users get a whole new feature that just comes up and they didn't have to pay a single dime. That's an upsell that can distinguish you in the industry as opposed to uh, we, we support back to Netscape 4.7. So in conclusion, I would say we do have an open web platform and I think browser diversity is a big win for us if we embrace these new ways of thinking about things instead of the old way for the last 10 years. Only one biker was harmed in the making of these slides, and I appreciate you guys listening to my angry white man rant. Thanks for being here.